was one of the most crucial battles of the war in Vietnam. We didn't really know what we were getting into. We come under intense fire. It was like we arrived at the fort out in the west and the Indians are all around it. For eight days, U.S. Marines fight to take back the South Vietnamese city of Hue. The adrenaline is pumping so hard that there's no time for fear. So you learn to depend upon each other. Those who were there will never forget the Battle of Hue. In the mountains of South Vietnam, two battalions of North Vietnamese soldiers move silently. They are preparing to attack the ancient city of Hue, a U.S. and South Vietnamese stronghold. It's the night before the Tet holiday, the Vietnamese New Year. In just a few hours, these enemy soldiers will bring in the holiday with the most brutal offensive of the entire war. They launched their assault in the dead of night. Marine Captain Jim Kulikan is awakened by the attack. About uh, 3.40 in the morning, um, I heard the first rocket come in. When you heard a rocket like that, that was big time, that was showtime. The North Vietnamese attack is not only surprising, it's considered shameful. Though the war has raged for years, both sides have always observed a truce during the New Year, the country's most sacred holiday. The assault on Hue is part of a nationwide campaign. 25 South Vietnamese cities are under simultaneous attack as part of the Tet Offensive. In the city of Hue, the attack is overwhelming. 6,000 North Vietnamese soldiers are invading from three directions. On the north side of the city, a few hundred South Vietnamese soldiers are surrounded in their army base within the walls of the ancient citadel. On the south side, just a few dozen American troops are trapped inside the military assistance compound known as MACV. Very quickly, the North Vietnamese control most of the city. Even the Americans are caught off guard. I had no idea of the scope of it, but you could tell that it was going on in other areas of the city. Across the Perfume River on the north side of the city, Lieutenant Wei Tran is home when the onslaught begins. I feel right away, I say, oh, they attack, they attack us. Tran commands an elite company of South Vietnamese soldiers. He desperately rides to where his troops are stationed. The moment Tran arrives, he and his troops are in a battle for their lives. The situation now is the enemy were everywhere. Across town, the American compound is also in chaos. Captain Jim Kulikan urgently mobilizes his men, who are now almost face to face with the enemy. The attack on the Macri compound was, um, they were close. I believe the North Vietnamese were in the wire. In the wire, enemy troops are now inside the compound. We killed several in the wire. I personally, uh, you know, I killed a few of them that were within, you know, I could have thrown a tennis ball close enough to, to hit them and all that. Manning a guard tower is Army Specialist 4th Class Frank Dozema. He's under heavy fire but holding his own. Then, everything changes. Kulikan goes in. When Frank was hit, I went out there and I, uh, I got some soldiers to wait on the base of fire. I went out to the tower. I went to put him on my shoulder, carry him down, and his leg was just dangling. 
So I had to uh, cut off what was remaining of his, whatever was holding his leg on, which wasn't much at all. And um, Frank was going to shock because he lost a great deal of blood. We did get Frank out, and uh, I believe he was still alive when we put him in a helicopter. I heard later on that he died on the medevac helicopter. And seldom does a day go by that I don't uh, think of him. In spite of Kulikin's heroic efforts, Frank Dozema is one of the first Americans to die in the battle for Way. He won't be the last. Kulikin and his men managed to fight off the attack at the American compound while Lieutenant Tran and his troops keep the enemy out of their headquarters. But by dawn, the rest of Wei has fallen to the communists. Of all the cities attacked during the Tet Offensive, Wei is symbolically most important. For centuries, it has been the cultural and spiritual capital of Vietnam. Whoever controls it, owns the heart of the Vietnamese nation. If the communist intention was to take and seize the cities, they came closer here at Way than anywhere else. And now the loss of Way was quite an important loss. The uh, communists swept right into it and took it. It made quite an impression on me. The mission for the Americans and their South Vietnamese allies is now both urgent and simple. Free way from the North Vietnamese. It won't be easy. Unlike the local Viet Cong, NVA troops are highly trained and ready to fight to the death to control the city of Hue. Once that realization came in, then we knew, or at least I knew, that it was a different fight at that time. Much different fight. They were very good fighters. Within just a few hours, over 6,000 communist soldiers have surrounded a few hundred U.S. and South Vietnamese troops stationed in Way. The Americans sent out a desperate plea for reinforcements. It's not just a city that's at stake. The spiritual heart and soul of Vietnam now hangs in the balance. Day one of the Tet Offensive. The North Vietnamese Army has captured the city of Hue. The attack is part of a larger campaign raging throughout South Vietnam. Capturing Hue is a huge victory for the communists and a key to taking the entire country. The NVA has surrounded the South Vietnamese Army's command post on the north side of the Perfume River as well as the American compound on the south side. The only hope is that reinforcements will arrive soon. They get the news at Marine headquarters, seven miles south in the town of Phu Bai. Alpha Company is quickly mobilized under the command of Gordon Batchelor. We were expecting the day off uh, and everything was quiet. <laughs> Things changed, and, and I was told that uh, something was going on, and we had been designated the reaction force. Bachelor and his men are now heading into unknown territory as they travel north. I didn't know where we were except by the map. I'd never been there before, so I didn't know what to expect. But it was uh, very quiet, not much activity. As Alpha Company reaches the outskirts of Way, they are greeted by heavy enemy fire. Captain Batchelor orders his men to continue the advance. Moments later, one of them goes down. Batchelor won't leave him. It was obvious that he had been hit. All of a sudden, I had an impulse that 
if he lays there for any longer, he's going to get shot again. The next thing I knew, I was laying face up and obviously had been hit. I just assumed I was going to bleed to death. I knew that nobody could get me out, and I started to run through all the prayers I knew, making all the apologies for all the bad things I had done. Bachelor is clinging to life, and Alpha Company is in deep trouble. Marine headquarters orders a second unit to weigh. Gulf Company, commanded by Captain Chuck Meadows, is about to dive directly into the mayhem. They have no idea what awaits them. We took nothing with us. We did not take our packs. We didn't take any extra chow. We didn't take any extra ammunition. Just kind of got ourselves up there, and, and off we went. It would be a costly miscalculation. On the outskirts of Wei, they are greeted by automatic weapons fire and find what's left of Alpha Company. As we moved forward there and we encountered our first actual wounded from Alpha Company, is when that seriousness of what we were getting into more or less soaked in. All of Alpha's officers are dead or wounded. Captain Gordon Batchelor desperately needs help. I rode the, the truck back to uh, Fubai, just absolutely certain that every bridge we went over had been mined and was going to be blown up. But we got back to Fubai, and I went through emergency surgery. Gradually, Gulf Company and what's left of Alpha navigate through the wave of enemy fire into the American compound, MACV. Though surrounded, the compound remains the only place in Way still under U.S. control. Gulf Company regroups and is ordered on a mission to rescue the South Vietnamese troops trapped inside the ancient citadel on the north side of the city. To pull it off, Gulf Company must first cross the Perfume River. But the Marines have no tanks and no heavy weapons. From the moment they arrive, the NVA won't let them cross the well-fortified bridge. We come under intense fire. We found that there was at least one automatic weapon. I would assume that would have been a machine gun in a bunkered emplacement Somehow, that machine gun nest needs to be taken out before they cross the bridge, or dozens of Marines will be slaughtered. One of Meadows' men has an idea. He found an opening where he could maneuver himself and a few of his troops, relatively unexposed to the fire of this machine gun, to a position where he could attack the bunker with hand grenades. Even with the machine gun knocked out, Gulf Company is still pinned down. The enemy continues to unload with everything they have, trying to keep them from crossing the bridge. We started encountering a lot of enemy resistance. A lot of automatic weapons fire. We received some rocket rounds. I think we received some mortar rounds. We come under intense fire. So we were in a terrible position. What started as a rescue mission begins to feel like a suicide mission. The South Vietnamese troops stranded at the Citadel will have to wait. The Americans have only one choice. They must retreat. It's a dangerous maneuver as they leave the bridge behind. So the decision was to retrograde back, which is a very difficult uh, move. Any retrograde move is difficult, but particularly when you only have one avenue to get back. Under intense fire, Gulf Company retreats along the same route that just cost them so much blood. The mission 
is a disaster. They return to the MACV compound, lucky to be alive. We had taken some 40-some casualties that first time. And now we're trying to get proper medical assistance for them. At the end of the first day of the Battle of Way, the Marines remain surrounded. We knew we would need some reinforcements. If we're going to continue with the jobs that we had there, that was going to have to happen. But no one knows when that will happen. Until help arrives, the Marines at MACV are on their own, and the rest of Way is now completely under communist control. Alpha and Golf companies desperately need more help to liberate the city of Way. Commanders at Marine Headquarters finally dispatch a third unit, Fox Company, led by Captain Mike Downs. We didn't really know what we were getting into, and to say that we went into Way City anticipating a major fight would be untrue. Private Danny Carter remembers expecting the trip to Way to be a short one. So we just thought we were going to be up there for over the next meal, which would have been that evening. We got on the helicopters, and nobody knew what the mission was. So on the surface, it appeared that this was going to be pretty good. The North Vietnamese Army controls virtually the entire city of Hue. To recapture it, U.S. troops must drive the NVA out of the south side, across the Perfume River, to the north side of town. To do that, they will have to take three government landmarks, including the provincial capitol building, which now flies a taunting North Vietnamese flag. The first target, the well-fortified Treasury Building. So the first squad started to move up the street and as they turned the corner, it was like all hell broke loose. The first casualty, I think, was Stanley Murdoch, who had told me that night that an angel came to him and told him that he wasn't going to make it. And, you know, being 19 years old, all I could think of was, well, at least you're going to be in heaven. I didn't know anything else to say to him. The angel was right. Private Murdoch is killed within minutes. Block by block, Fox Company battles its way down the narrow streets of Way. Every house, alley, and garden that's secured is paid for with marine blood. We weren't prepared for street fighting and the house-to-house -house combat, the searching the house and knowing how to clear a house. We had to learn by the seat of our pants or just common sense or sometime in the era. We could not see more than a block ahead of us. We were lucky to see the, the building across the street from us, and that's as far as it went. You couldn't see in the windows. You couldn't see who might be inside the buildings. The only target that we saw was the rifle flashes. But when you saw three or four grouped rifle flashes in a window, I'd concentrate on that. NVA troops are as elusive as they are relentless. For hours, the Marines are under intense fire. It seemed like the firefight lasted a long time. And the next thing I remember, it was getting too dark to fight. I don't know how much time had gone by. We suffered a significant number of casualties, dead and wounded. And as dark fell, we were ordered back 
to MACV compound. Commanders are not able to keep an exact count of casualties, but they're heavy. Worst of all, there is little to show for all of the dead and wounded. As dawn breaks, the Marines need to regroup and come up with a new plan to take the Treasury. Headquarters urgently sends one more unit to Mac V, Hotel Company, led by Captain Ron Christmas. When they arrive, they join Alpha, Golf, and Fox companies in what is a dire situation. It was very much like we've arrived at the fort, you know, out in the west, and the Indians are all around it, uh, attacking it, and you have all of these uh, defenders hanging out windows or off walls. It doesn't take long before Hotel Company joins with other Marine units in the attack. The Treasury is just one of several strong points they're assigned to conquer. And once it falls, they'll begin clearing out the rest of the NVA positions, building by building. Each one of these strong points uh, was built normally a two or three story building. It was surrounded by a courtyard anywhere from 40 to 50 meters of courtyard around it, surrounded by a stone wall. And the stone wall was like a stone picket fence, so you have firing ports from it. An urban fight is done within about 35 meters of each other. You see the enemy, he sees you. Urban conflict is really the nastiest, the dirtiest of all types of, of warfare. As the Marines creep towards the Treasury, one of the men takes a gamble, suddenly changing the whole operation. One of the sergeants, who shouldn't have been in point, I don't know why he was, walked around a corner and was immediately cut down as the first of AK-47. And of course, pandemonium happened. We started firing at everything around, you know, any window, any, anything we could. The enemy disperses. Hotel company then takes up a firing position in a building a few blocks from the treasury. Once we were into the building, we could see the treasury I think at that time I started to realize that uh, this was quite, you know, this was going to be a very up close and personal fight. The Marines set up a machine gun on the second story. We had found a good gun position. We were in good, had a good field of fire. So we didn't think we had been spotted. When they hit us with RPGs, I was just totally stunned. My assistant gunner was really messed up. I mean, he was just really messed up. And here comes the rescue team. And so they grab me and take me down. The adrenaline is pumping so hard that there's no time for fear. Fear always comes later when you sit down you know, when you're behind the wall and there's nothing going on. When you're engaged, you're engaged, and that's all you have time for. The NVA fire from the Treasury is murderous, forcing the Marines to once again abandon the attack. Suddenly I was in a war. It started to get tense. You could hear the gunfire going off all around you. All night long there was things going off, whether it be flares or small arms fire kept you on edge. Death makes you afraid, and being maimed seriously makes you afraid, and watching your comrades get just butchered sends shivers. The situation is critical. The Marines need a new strategy if they are to take the machine gun infested treasury building. But they're running out of options.
In three days of bloody fighting, Marines have taken back only a few blocks of way. Their most formidable obstacle remains the Treasury Building, defended by enemy troops with machine guns. Hotel and Fox companies will lead yet another assault. This one laid out on the city streets. In between the two companies is a corner. That's where this machine gun fire is coming from. It's laying down heavy fire up and down the street to our direct front. So in order to get across the street, we have to go through this machine gun fire to get across the street. Small streets that aren't broad esplanades make terrific cones of fire. If you can get a machine gun or an automatic weapon to fire an enfilade down a broad avenue, you can literally control it. Nobody can cross it. The Marines need cover. Their first option, a smoke screen, a basic military tactic. You run a fire team across the street, get a foothold, and then you build from there. Well, the professional NVA soldier had read the same book. It fired into the smoke. All four members of the fire team are mowed down by the machine gun. The Marines need a new plan, or this mission will end up as another bloodbath. They need bigger firepower that will clear out the area. I brought in my platoon commanders. OK, how are we going to do this? Well, very fortunately, I had assigned for battalion a 106 recoilless rifle. The 106 recoilless rifle is a bazooka-like weapon that fires an artillery shell out of the front and emits a huge smoky exhaust out the back. It's mobile, accurate, and deadly. But to successfully take the Treasury Building, the Marines have to somehow position the 106 for a clean shot without getting killed. We're talking this out, and I hear this voice from Lance Corporal. And Lance Corporal said, Skipper, I know how to do this. He said, I'll roll my gun. I'll turn that gun. We'll fire the 106. They'll pull down their head. You want, you can, under the back blast, you can run the whole company across the street. Now, you've got to understand, you know, Rounds are cracking all around these young men. Finally, you hear him say, fire the 106, fire the 106. It stopped the fire. We ran a whole platoon across the street under the back blast. It's the Marines' first taste of victory. But with every street captured, there was another to be crossed. And with every house secured, dozens more are hiding NVA troops. But gradually, Marines draw within a block of the well-fortified Treasury Building, where once again, deadly machine gun fire awaits them. Getting inside this imposing three-story building seems impossible. But Major John Salvati comes to Captain Mike Downs with an idea. If it works, the enemy will be flushed out of the building. I noticed that adjacent to the MAGV compound was a supply dump. And I just happened to notice stacked against the wall was a whole bunch of crates of EA gas launchers. And when I went down to Mike Downs, I knew he was having difficulty getting across the street. And I thought, what else? Maybe the gas. The gas is tear gas. It doesn't kill, but will overpower anyone it envelops. The E-8 gas launcher hurls tear gas projectiles up to 250 meters, well within the Marines' range. Major Salvati explained to me the E-8 gas launcher and what he thought it could do. And, of course, we had gas masks, and the enemy did not. Went out in the courtyard, set the thing up, pulled the lanyard, and it detonated. As soon as we fired it, Mike Downs had his people online with their gas masks. So it was in real short order. Mike's people were in the building. 
the gas works. North Vietnamese soldiers pour out of the Treasury building and pull back. But the NVA has a deadly trick up their sleeves that the Marines never expect. U.S. troops have finally entered a critical enemy stronghold in the battle for Hue, the Treasury Building. But the NVA has a deadly surprise waiting. They were pursuing enemy out of the Treasury. And they had retreated from the Treasury to draw us into another ambush. They hadn't just run away from the battle, they drew us into their battle from the Treasury. It's in a field of fire, crossfire. Had a whole line of troops, you know, sitting in some buildings. One guy, he just got blown away. I mean, just massive machine gun attack, but from two sides. Caught in the crossfire, Corporal Warren faces a crucial life or death decision. I could have turned around and ran back to cover, which they would have killed me. I was in a field of fire or I could have advanced in front of the uh, wounded Marine and gave suppressive fire while the rest of the fire team came up. And that's the, the action I chose to do. I just let loose on everything, back and forth, and it was successful. They quit firing. We successfully recovered the Marine and uh, then we retreated to cover. By taking the treasury, the Marines have finally carved out a toehold in this fight. But most of Wei still remains in enemy hands. Two blocks from the treasury is the next objective, the city's massive hospital complex. But as the Marines advance through Wei's enemy-infested neighborhoods, they are about to face another unseen danger. Snipers. The NVA has them positioned all over the city. They always scared the Dickens out of me because you never heard the round. You never knew where they were. I never saw a sniper, uh, sniper fire at me. And it, a bullet creased the top of my ear. You know, I, I heard it, I felt it, and then I said, oh, and blood starts running down my ear. That's enough to just make you wet your pants right there. There's only one way to avoid the deadly snipers. It's a matter of dashes, a matter of crawling, a matter of jumping up and running. There's a certain amount of chances you gotta take. You didn't have time to be afraid or anything like that. It was your job to advance, fight as an infantryman. That's what you joined for, and now you're getting it. As the Marines advance toward the hospital, NVA fire is taking a heavy toll. But a downed Marine could always count on others coming to his aid. I was absolutely confident that if it was me laying on that street, I'd be rescued or my body would be recovered. Absolutely confident at all times. So I was gonna absolutely make sure that my comrades were taken care of at all times. And I never met a Marine that didn't feel that way. Dodging rocket-propelled grenades and snipers, the Marines need most of the day to get within striking range of the hospital. Because the hospital complex was spread out, for the first time we took all three companies and we put them online. And we assaulted into the hospital complex simultaneously. Marines storm the hospital and begin the dangerous task of clearing it room by room. 
kind of surround the door, you know, with a Marine on each side or a couple of Marines on each side. And then into the room uh, very quickly. You tried to identify if there were any targets in the room, but it was almost impossible to do that in these rooms. Other Marines lob grenades, but it's especially risky. We learned quickly to pull the pin, and in training, you're taught to hold the safety lever, what's commonly called a spoon, and then let it release as you throw it, so that now you've got three to five seconds before the detonation. Well, we wanted no part of that. So we would let the lever go and start it cooking before we would throw it in, so that there wasn't any chance at all that it would come back out. But there is one more danger Marines will soon encounter at the hospital. Another NVA secret weapon. Marines have recaptured several sections of way in their efforts to liberate the city. Now they're on the verge of taking another key landmark, the main hospital. The operation is especially dangerous because it's infested with both the North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong. The intelligence we had was that we were warned that the Viet Cong, not the NVA, but the Viet Cong, were in fact impersonating patients. The one that is the most notorious is a Marine walking down a ward, and here comes what he thought was a, a nun. Uh, the nun raised up a pistol. Fortunately, the Marine was quicker. Within two hours, the hospital is recaptured. Control of the city is beginning to shift. Now, all that's left is the provincial capitol building, with its menacing communist flag flying overhead. From day one, we could look up and we could see the province capitol building and the NVA flag. And that flag just, well, we became fixated on it. It just bothered us. You know, the fact is, we were going to get to that flag. Within a week, four companies of bloodied Marines have struggled to take back way one block at a time. Now, the exhausted troops need to rally again to capture the capital and truly liberate the city. But the North Vietnamese are vicious in their defense of the capital complex. That provincial headquarters had more outbuildings and places where the NVA could be uh, to take you either with plunging fire or enfilading fire than any, any position I saw in Hue. That was just a bad one. The Marines will use the same strategy that helped them take the Treasury building, tear gas. As we approached the province capital building, I decided to do, we were going to go in under gas again. I said, make the run. Once again, the tear gas works. Under fire, the Marines storm the Capitol building and flush out the remaining NVA troops. The Marines are on the verge of victory. With the last stronghold of the NVA, the Capitol, finally in American hands. Ron Christmas has one last order for his battle fatigued Marines. I was going to take down the flag and we were going to raise the American flag. So I put the word out to uh, some of the men in the company. I said, go find me a flag because when we go into this courtyard and we go into this building, we're going to take that flag down. And at that time, took my uh, flag I had in my flak jacket and hooked it up to the same hooks. And we got the American flag hooked up and raised it up. And that was quite a momentous occasion. I could hear yelling and screaming, cheering, from all directions. Men were, were hanging out the windows, cheering when that fly went up. 
it was one of those moments that lit literally just the hair stands up on the back of your neck and, and you just get goose flesh. And the, the weight of all you've been carrying, of all you've seen, of all the horror and all of the, the death and destruction is lifted for just a moment when that happens. And that touches a Marine's emotional button. In fact, it doesn't touch it, it mashes the hell out of it. And it did that day in the courtyard outside the provincial headquarters. The struggle for the southern section of Way City is finally over. It will take the Marines three more weeks and many more lives to also liberate the north side of the city. They lived up to the reputation of the Marines. They could be proud over what they did. They didn't have the forces in there to recapture Way right away. I think that the display of bravery is unbelievable to me. Our mission was to retake the city. We retook the city. I think when you look at the history of the Corps, Way City is up there with all the famous battles where the Marine Corps acquitted itself very well in the battlefield. Close to half the Marines committed to the Battle of Way were killed or wounded. Overall, 221 Marine and Army troops paid with their lives to liberate the city. I think the faces of the men who died, they don't haunt me. But what they are is a remembrance of the sheer strength of these young men, the sheer faithfulness of these young men, the love for one another of these young men. I think you should celebrate, I do, these wonderful men. Yes, they gave their lives but they were wonderful men, wonderful Marines. I think every Marine who comes out of Quantico, Paris Island, or San Diego has a very, very special bond with every other Marine. And I mean that past, present, and future. What makes you understand it in your heart as well as in your mind is when you go through something, some crucible, some trial by fire, such as Way City. When you and if you come out the other end of something like that, no man who stood with you in that fight will ever be anything but your brother.